I'm here today with Jill. She is a Gold Star mom. Um, she lost her son, Ben, um, overseas during a firefight, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Um, and this was, as we were talking earlier, coming up on 11 years. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody can ever tell anybody how long it takes to grieve, and I don't believe you can ever grieve enough for when you're losing a family member. Yeah. I don't think that ever goes away. It doesn't. Um, but I'd like to welcome you to the show and talk about your life, your experience, um, you as a mom. Mm. Um, in the military, I know even my own personal experience, um, I have brothers and sisters that were all in the military. Mm -hmm. And the only one that wasn't in the military was my mother. Oh. And we had so much respect for her because of what she had to go through, not knowing what her children were going to be going through. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, there are a lot of mothers out there that, that have sons and daughters that are, you know, thinking about joining and looking at that decision of how do they handle this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm hoping to get a, maybe a little insight. Well, I can certainly provide that. Um, in Ben's case, he knew, or I knew, when he was about seven or eight years old, that he was going to join the military. And it was a gut feeling that I had based on watching him interact with his great-grandfather, my grandfather, who was a World War II veteran. I raised Ben as a single mom, and he was my only child. So the strongest male role model that he had in his life was his great-grandfather. Who was military. Who was World War II. And the World War II vets, I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak for all of them, but I'll say my grandfather was not pro-military. He wasn't anti-military. He joined the military out of duty to country. That's what you did in, in that era. And I don't come from a military family. But he had a, um, they, my grandparents had a lake home in northern Minnesota. Ben, I spent a lot of time up there as a kid myself, and then when I became a mother at a very young age, I wanted Ben to have the same experiences, so we spent a lot of time up there. Ben took notice of a curio cabinet that my grandfather had, and it had his, his service memorabilia in there, including Purple Heart that he had earned, certificates of service, a couple other um, you know, pins of commendation, some photos. And Ben just started asking him questions about it. And as he got a little bit older, the questions became a little more detailed. And you could see the curiosity being picked in his little brain about what exactly all this stuff meant. And it just, I could just see that it resonated with him. And it resonated even not just because it was military, but because he loved, admired, and respected that man so much exactly. that he wanted to be like him. Yep. He wanted to be like him. So from a very young age, Ben started to say, when I grow up, I'm going to join the army, just like he called him Ayai. Ayai was his nickname. Okay. I'm going to join the army just like Ayai. Well, as Ben got a little older and he continued to say that, and he, he had gotten more answers to the questions from Ayai about his service, you know, what was it like to be in a war? What was it like to be in, in overseas in Europe? How did you get there? How do you dig a foxhole? What kind of guns did you shoot? You know, all kinds of things like that. And then, you know, my grandfather would, you know, pick his curiosity or satisfied and answer those questions. And so then Ben said, you know, well, when I grow up, I want to join the army like you. Well, my grandfather said, you know, imitation is not the greatest form of flattery. He said, you need to grow up and become what you're meant to become, not because someone else did it. Don't imitate people. Do what you're meant to become. Mm -hmm. And he said, one day you'll know what that is because you're going to get a gut feeling and there, there'll, be, there'll be no denying what that is. Well, that happened when Ben was 13. My grandfather succumbed to cancer. Uh, in the spring of 2001, April of 2001. It was the first death that Ben had experienced mm -hmm. and it absolutely wrecked him. It just tore his heart out of his chest and it hurt him so much, he said he didn't want to talk about it. So I didn't make him talk about it. 
Plus, he was 13. 13 year old boys don't really talk anyway. They kind of just sure. mumble and moan and groan at you. So <laughs> I was, yeah, and grunt and grunt, yeah. I was okay giving him that space. But five months later, 9 11 happened. Then his sadness turned to anger and he wanted revenge because those innocent lives that were lost on American soil on 9 11 was personal to Ben. It was a mockery of his great grandfather's service to America. So Ben at the wise age of 13 got that gut feeling that his great grandfather warned him about. Mm -hmm. Who knew it would come so quick and so young? But there it was. And Ben made a declaration that when I grow up, I'm going to become an army ranger. I'm going to find Osama bin Laden. I'm going to make him pay. And anybody who knew that kid from that day forward never doubted that he would make good on that promise. That was his mission. That was his mission in life. And, and so when you ask the question, I know that's a really long answer yeah, to, you know, what does it mean to be a mother and have a child that wants to join the military? For me, there was just no way around it. And I never questioned whether or not I should let him go. I never felt it was up to me. I, I knew that that kid had it in him. It was, it was his life mission. So did you ever go through it? I mean, I mean, here's your son, you know, standing up going, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to be a ranger, I'm going to go fight Osama bin Laden. How did that hit you? I can revert back to, you know, what I just said, that I knew it was part of his purpose. I think the underlying question there might be, was I scared? You know, yeah, was it, did I have any sort of trepidations about that? No, I didn't. And this is why, because I lost a brother when I was 15. He was hit by a car. He was 11 years old. He was the youngest of four kids. And I honestly believed when Ben went into the military, it had been 24 years since my brother was killed. I thought I'd already paid the pauper. I, uh, I very naively believed that I've already had that one really god-awful thing happen to me that was going to happen in life. And I actually felt grateful about it, like, oh, thank you, Lord, that I got that out of the way when I was really young. I mean, just a really naive and incredibly selfish thing to feel, in, in my opinion. No one's told me that. That's just my own thought process. But in a lot of times when we, when we have such a big event occur, we think, okay, we're, we're good for a few we're years. We're good for a while. <laughs> yeah, we're good for a while. Exactly. exactly. Like the, the water's going to be smooth for a while. Mm -hmm. So I never went in my head to losing Ben. Never once did I. And, and that, was a, that was the foundation of it. The other part was that Ben was a really tough guy. He was super independent, which was in part because of the way I raised him. I knew he was cut out for the military. I knew it was something that he would be good at. He was so driven about uh, life, just so driven about what he wanted to do. And just so um, he just had that true north about him. So it was um, he's not going to get killed. Because he's a badass, literally, you know. Mm -hmm. He's going to run towards that gunfire, and, and no bad guy is going to get to him because he's been cop. Yeah. You no? Know? Exactly. And, and that, that part was humbling to me because it doesn't matter. When it's your time, it's your time. Exactly. When it's your time, it's your time. You know, you can, you can be in that, in that firefight, in that gunfight, whatever that might look like. In Ben's case, that's truly what it was. But when it's your time, it's your time. Exactly, exactly. And luckily you were able to be there for Ben. I was. I was. The, the circumstance of Ben's injury and then death was that he was wounded in Afghanistan in a firefight with the Taliban. He was, um, there was a sniper, a Taliban sniper that had pinned down his team of snipers. And they were called forward to help. They, they called for help and the, they wouldn't send an airstrike or anyone else in. So it was up to the guys on the ground to come forward. So Ben was a gun team leader. And so he came forward and he saved six of his fellow Rangers. Three of them were actually snipers. And they were, they were, their lives were in jeopardy. And one of them says that he thought he was going to die. 
and he felt so close to death himself that he was seconds away from pulling a pin on a grenade because he didn't want to die at the hands of the enemy. And then he, he realized that Ben had come forward and saved him. So Ben took a bullet in that firefight. He was carried out of that area by his rangers. Um, the bullet was, was to the leg. He underwent surgery in Afghanistan and never woke up is, is how it went down. There was um, some things that happened after the surgery that didn't cause his death, but were part of the reason. There was a number of things. You might want to call it a perfect storm, uh, an anomaly, um, however way you, you want to word it. There were things that um, contributed to that. So he underwent the surgery, though, in Afghanistan. He was then uh, um, transported to Germany, where he, at Landstuhl Army Medical Center, spent about 24 hours there, and then landed at Walter Reed in Washington, D.C., four days after he was shot. The day after he arrived at Walter Reed, he was determined to be brain dead. So the, the brain death allowed him to become an organ donor. And so I got to spend time in the hospital with him, though, and that was your, your question, that I did get to spend time with him. And as, as goofy as it may sound to say that I'm grateful for the way that Ben died, I'm grateful for the way that Ben died because I did get to spend that time with him. I didn't have to go meet a casket at Dover. I didn't get a knock on the door. I got a phone call. I got a life-changing phone call. My life, you know, Pre that day, the minute before that phone call and after that day are, are two completely different stories. But I got to spend five days in the hospital with Ben. I got to hold his hand. I got to talk to him. I got to tell him how much I loved him and how proud I was of him. He was not conscious but I, the whole time, but I knew he heard me. And, and he was um, being kept alive artificially on life support, but blood was flowing through his body. He was warm. And I... I often say, if I live to be 200, no five days will ever mean more to me than that time I got because families generally don't get that time. They just don't. And so I'm so grateful, so grateful for that. And you actually got to uh, speak up for him as yeah. far as being a donor is concerned. Yep. Um, and make sure his wishes were followed out. I did. Um, now I do, and I did understand that um, the heart was was the first organ to be donated. Yes, um, which happened to be a kind of relation it, offset. She, yeah, the Ben's heart recipient was a, an acquaintance of my cousin. Now, when we sat down, my parents and I sat down with the the doctors at the hospital, and when we knew what his what the outcome was going to be that Ben was going to become an organ donor. We had a meeting, you know, at which ones? You know, they told us everything that was going to go on, and I got to choose, you know, which, which organs do I want to donate, and Ben, ben said all of them, so I'm every, everything. They told us that we could designate a recipient to any of those major organs if we knew somebody who was actually on the transplant list. And I said, okay, you know, Mom, do you know anyone? Dad, do you know anyone? And you're like, nope, okay, next question. Like, it just didn't even sink in. Yeah. We didn't, we didn't know anyone. Later that afternoon, or the, I think it was the next morning, I was supposed to meet with a casualty assistance officer um, at our hotel. She was coming. She was assigned in D.C. Um, I had one from Minnesota, but the Army requires that you have one in the state that you're from and then the state in which the death occurs. Okay. So I had to have a meeting with this woman from D.C. Well, she called and said she was going to be late. So now all of a sudden I had an hour of free time. The day before I had posted a message on Ben's CaringBridge website about what had happened, what the, what the final outcome was, if you will, that Ben was brain dead, was not gonna survive his injuries, he would become an organ donor, thank you for all the prayers, etc. So I thought, well, I'm gonna go sit at the computer in the lobby and read through those messages for a little bit. So I stumbled upon a message from my cousin, Maria, who lives in Chicago, offering condolences and then thanking me for honoring Ben's wishes to become an organ donor 
because she had a friend who was waiting for a heart. Now, we never told anybody that we could designate every. I didn't put a sign out or a post out that said, hey, anybody need an organ? Mm. You know, we really, and it's like, not usually in the, in the back of your it, mind to do not, that. No, it's <laughs> the, absolutely not. Like, like I said, it didn't even sink in with us. We barely paid attention to that question. But when I saw that message, it was, I felt as though a neon lights started flashing, like ding, 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 or I pulled three sevens on a slot machine, like, oh my gosh, I know somebody who needs a heart. And it was my cousin's friend. It wasn't somebody I didn't know. So I run back in this conference room. My dad was sitting in there just you know, biding the time. And I said, Dad, Maria knows somebody who needs a heart. We got to call her. So essentially, we put our people in touch with her people and just put it in the hands of God. Went on with the day. I had a million other things you know, going on through my mind, so I wasn't pondering the what ifs, it's just what is meant to be will, will be. Exactly. So my dad and I and a couple of rangers that served with Ben that had come to the hospital and were there also to be support means to me, we're walking down the street to go to dinner. Five o'clock ish, it was fairly early and I got a call from Maria. And she said, Jill, you are not gonna believe this, but they are a match. Judy and Ben are a match. And she said, this is an absolute miracle. Yep. Her mother, who is a devout Catholic, said, this is a true Catholic miracle. This is not green lights to work, all the way to work miracle. This is a true Catholic miracle. And I froze in my tracks. I couldn't walk. I was, oh my gosh, like I, I just didn't know what to say. And my dad says, what, you know, what, what is it? And I'm like, it's Maria. And they're a match, and I just handed him the phone. And this is the part where I always choke up. As I said, in that moment, I felt as though my feet were in cement. I couldn't, I couldn't move. But at the same time, if I would have lifted my arms like this, I would have taken flight. I just felt light as a feather and as heavy as concrete at the same moment. And I thought, this has to be what a miracle feels like. And I attuned the heavy and the light to joy and sorrow. I got to have a, a walk on a, on a beam between an ocean of joy and an ocean of sorrow at the same time. That's a miracle. Definitely. Yeah, Definitely. that's a miracle. Yeah, those matches don't, don't normally show up They right absolutely, away. very, very rare for a heart recipient to have it be a designated donor, extremely rare. And, and I have got to meet her um, numerous times I've put my hand on her chest and felt Ben's heart um, marching on, beating on numerous times. Um, very, very grateful for that. What that feels like is hard to put into words. It, it really is hard. It's, it's awesome. It's amazing. It's magnificent. It's unbelievable. It's and miraculous. It's ben. It is Ben. It absolutely is Ben. Mm -hmm. Judy was a 57 year old single female who got the heart of a 21-year-old Army Ranger. She is uh, still she's doing, doing good. She's doing really well <laughs> 11 years later. We're pretty sure she's going to live to be about 185. You know, <laughs> if, you know, when you're 57 and you get to go backwards, what is that, 36 years? That's significant. That's significant. She's doing very well, has never had any rejection issues with Ben's heart ever. I, I recently um, I have a memorial event coming up for Ben, mm -hmm. and I was selling raffle tickets, and I use social media for that, and I, I sold close to 200 tickets, so I had interaction with a lot of people. And one of the guys that reached out to me, someone that I was friends with on Facebook but never communicated with, just saw the mutual friends, and you know there are people like that that you don't interact with, they're just out there. And he sent me a message and said he wanted a, a ticket. And then he sent me a picture. And it was a letter that I had written to the men of Ben's battalion and company when they were preparing to go on the next deployment after Ben died. And I was like, oh my gosh. And he said, ma'am, I apologize that it's taken me this long to communicate with you. And he said, I wasn't able to attend Ben's funeral because I was still working and 
I wasn't, he said, I just couldn't bring myself to, to reach out to you, but he said, I was the one who called for the medevac for Ben. And he said, I was there with him. And he said, I've kept this letter all these years. And I just want to thank you and tell you how much it meant to me. Yeah, I mean, that's like, whew, uh, what a wonderful thing. And, you know, to, to have that come back in front of me again um, at 10 years later, that shows the profound effect that Ben's life and my life has had on them. And I'm, I'm humble. I don't like to take credit for those things. I give it all to Ben, yep. say it's because of him. But I, I know it came from me in part as well. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. Because... You know, I, I, I understand you're an extremely humble woman. <laughs> and, you know, I, and I've listened to your other talks and things like this, and, and I have heard that you, you give a lot of glory to, to, to Ben, and you give a lot of glory to our, ma our maker as well. Amen, yeah. Um, and not wanting to diss either one of those, you do have a say in this, and I want to thank you for your part in it. Because you happen, you allow these things to go on. You allow people to come up to you and say, "Hey, listen, you know, we are so grateful for the story that you that you put out there, that has touched our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, we are so grateful for being able to just come up and talk to you." Mm -hmm. um, I know you just did um, the uh, hundred mile march, not yeah. too long ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and marched with a lot of military personnel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And to stand side by side after having such a loss takes a lot of strength mm -hmm. on your side. And I want to thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, you're welcome. I'll say you're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, now it's, we're both tearing up. Now I'm tearing <laughs> up, and that's not something that I normally do because I'm, I'm humble. I don't like to take credit for this, but I, I, I know that I have to because I'm here. I'm the living, breathing survivor of, of Ben, and I am, I've taken on the responsibility of seeing to it that his legacy lives on in a respectful and honorable manner. Um, I made a promise to Ben on his deathbed that I would spend the rest of my life attempting to make myself, to make him as proud of me as I got to be of him, get to be of him, and got to be at that point. And that I would not align myself with any person or organization that would disrespect or dishonor his memory. And I've stayed true to that. I've stayed true to that. And, you know, fortunately, I haven't had to, you know, push too many people away, but there's, there's been a few people and organizations. I don't focus on that. I focus on how much I do get to do and how much I have got to do to honor Ben's legacy and his memory. And when my mother and I were in Washington, D.C., the first night, the day that we were told that he wasn't going to survive, we were in the hotel room um, at night with the lights out. And you know, you lay in bed and, and chit chat for a little bit. And it all of a sudden dawned on me that Ben was no longer going to physically be a part of my life. And I said, Mom, what am I going to do with all the love? And, sh and I thought, you know, I'm going to ask her because she had lost her son. At that point, you know, 27 years earlier, so she had survived for that many years. And she said, you know, what, what love, Jill? And I said, my love for Ben, he's not going to be here anymore. And she paused, and I was waiting for this, you know, profound answer. And she told me five words. Four. Four. <laughs> uh, you'll figure it out. In other words, she couldn't tell you. She couldn't tell me. You had to. I had to figure it out. And, uh, and she was right. And I have figured it out. And I figured out that I figured it out not that long ago. <laughs> um, what I do is just continue. The, the love doesn't go anywhere. It's still here. I still have as much love 
for Ben and to give with him, for him, by him. He's just not the physical recipient of it. Everybody else is. And that's, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's such a blessing to everybody that you do come in contact. I hope so. I hope so. Um, I want to go ahead and um, tell people about the Heart of a Ranger. Uh, heart of a Ranger. Yep. Um, this was about his story. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, this also includes um, how his Ranger buddies uh, talked about him. Yes. Yeah. Now we had uh, Bill on here last year. Okay. Yeah. Um, talking about the book. Um, which is one of the reasons I had to make sure I had to get you on here. Yeah, yeah, thank um, you. It, it just, it never goes away no. once you hear a story. It never goes away. Yeah. Um, now, I also understand that Ben helped you to get out there a little bit more. He did, yeah, he did. Um, and you've got um, a uh, motorcycle run? We, I've been doing, um, I, here's, here's the flyer that I have, um, and we can share this after the fact too, maybe on the, on the website even, but the Ben Cott Memorial Ride. This is the 11th year. It has been 11 years since Ben died. The first one in 2009 was unofficial, okay. Ben Cott Memorial Ride, but for the last 10 years, this will be the 10th, it has been the Ben Cott Memorial Ride. I've partnered with the fiscal sponsor. I have a brand new one this year, the CVMA, Combat Veterans Motorcycle Association, Chapter 48-2, which who are just amazing, wonderful, wonderful people who have just come to, to love dearly. But the money that we raise for this event stays in Minnesota to help our combat veterans through the CVMA chapters, um, 48-2. It's a motorcycle ride, a pig roast. We have live music. We, uh, it's been a, a great event every year. I mean, we wouldn't keep going if it wasn't. Well, exactly. So we're supported by it. The community loves it. We start and end in Apple Valley. Uh, it's been called the best no feet down between the stops ride oh, in the nice. metro, which means we don't stop. Mm -hmm. we have, um, we're on backcountry roads where we're not encountering traffic, very little traffic, and we have road guards in place to um, stop that traffic so we can just keep sailing on through to our next stop. And anybody who has a motorcycle can... Anybody who has a motorcycle is, is welcome to come. There's a Facebook page for it, Ben Cobb Memorial Ride. There's a website, bencobbmemorialride.com. You can look on Bogart's Entertainment Center uh, website. There's you know numerous places to find information about that. It's a great time. We generally have around 200 motorcycles. It's a great day. It's an event that I, I look forward to every year, and it's a celebration of life. It's not a sad event. Um, we cross over. There's a bridge in Coates Township, which is right next to Rosemount, where Ben grew up, where um, a bridge has been memorialized. It's called the Ben Cop, uh, Corporal Ben S. Cop Memorial Bridge. So our first stop as a group is always to the bridge, and we, we do what we all get out, take about 10 minutes, do a group photo. And, and move along, but it's a, just another way to ensure that Ben's legacy lives on, that he's never forgotten. But it also, for me, I don't see it as being about me. I don't see it as being just about Ben. I see it as using Ben's name and the, the recognition, the name recognition that he has achieved, I'll say, in the last 11 years to raise awareness and educate the public about who our fallen are and who our, their families are. That it, they're not just names on the white tablets in the cemeteries, they're not just names in the newspaper or, or pictures. Jill, um, I'm honored to actually have you on our show. I really am. Um, it's a pleasure to meet Ben's mom, but it's also a pleasure just to meet you. We try to reach out to our families, you know, to the, the vets that we've lost. Thank you. There's some white families back there. We, we really need to, to keep in touch with them. Yes, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me.